Welcome. Have y'all recovered from Christmas? Okay, good. First service didn't, so I just uh, I needed to make sure. Uh, they booed when I had them stand up and kind of do a stretching exercise, and so I won't, I won't make you do that either. But hey, good morning. My name is Cameron. I'm one of the pastors here. I am glad to be preaching the very last Sunday of 2020. Can I get an amen? It's over. It's over. Yes, we can cheer about that. Uh, but don't get your hopes up. I, I don't know how much is going to change when January 1st comes around, um, at least in the world in which we live. Uh, but a whole lot of change can happen in our hearts. And that's the hope. That's the goal uh, this morning. Uh, if you have your Bibles, Philippians chapter 3, I've got an invitation for you. Don't worry, not a resolution. The verdict is in. Resolutions do not work. Uh, but I do have an invitation for you from Philippians chapter 3. One big task and one big truth this morning we're going to look at. But first, um, a, a story. I don't ever tell stories. Um, probably because nothing cool ever happens to me. And this story definitely isn't cool. Uh, but let me tell you a, a story. I, I ran a race once, just once. Um, and this is how it came about. My wife and I were moving with the family up to Orlando to go on staff at a church years ago. And about three weeks before going up to Orlando, I got a call from my buddy who was going to be my soon-to-be boss there at the church. And he called and he said, hey man, what's going on? I can't wait to get you up here. Uh, the reason for the call is a bunch of us on the staff are going to be running in a 5K race together. Uh, and I was wondering, do you want to run it with us? It'll be fun. And you can, you can get to know one another uh, during the race. And so immediately a bunch of thoughts start running like rapid fire through my head. Like, running's not fun. Who gets to know one another while they're running a race? I've never run a race before. I hate, I, I loathe running. Uh, and so with that, with that trajectory in mind, naturally you would have imagined that I would have said something like, you know, Chris, man, thanks so much for the offer, uh, but I'm going to have to pass this time. Right? Of course not. Of course not. I said, yeah, man, let's do it with enthusiasm and fervor. Uh, because underneath those initial thoughts were a bunch of other thoughts, more people-pleasing thoughts, like, oh, how bad can this be? I really want to make a good impression. Is this a trap? Like, what's going on here? Uh, maybe I can really do this. So I said, yes, let's do it. Let's run the race. Uh, meanwhile, my buddy Chris is like 1% body fat, like all athletic and jazz. Uh, and, and what I didn't know at the time was, because I don't run for recreation. I don't know why some of you do, but praise you. And praise God for you. But I, I didn't know that when you run a race, specifically this race, that there are two different categories for running. You can choose the leisure category, uh, which means you can run it, you can walk it, you can skip it and take a nap. You know, that, that's the category to run a race if you want to get to know one another. And then there's another category, the competitive category, the runner category. Guess which one my buddy chose for us? The competitive category, which forced us to like finish at a certain time. Uh, and we, we ran the race. Uh, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Uh, I got passed by a firefighter in full gear. <laughs> and I'm convinced I injured myself when I finally finished the race. It hurt for like three months when I took deep breaths. But uh, the, the point of the story, I don't have a point of the story, really. It's to gain some sympathy to start. Uh, the second, the reason I told you the story is uh, this is the picture um, that Paul paints in Philippians 3 uh, to kind of sum up the Christian life. He paints this picture of a race and a runner running a marathon and reaching forward for the goal. And he uses this picture to kind of sum up the, the Christian life and to kind of paint this picture of Christian maturity in the call to Christ likeness. And so I've got an invitation for you this morning. Here's the invitation. Are you ready? Two words. Grow up. Grow up, would you? You ever been told that by your parents before? Grandparents, your wife, your significant other, your children? Go ahead, go ahead, do it. Look at your neighbor and say, grow up, would you? Oh, come on. I'm giving you guys permission to tell your significant other to grow up. Do it with some gusto. This is the moment some of you guys have been waiting for. Grow up. You're welcome. You're welcome. Merry Christmas. Don't say I never gave you anything. Here's the deal. These two words, they encompass so much of the Christian life. Growing up, maturing, uh, developing, evolving, adulting, right? Grow 
up. Now, why? Why are we talking about growing up this morning? Okay, let me get depressing for a second. I'll try to make it quick. 2020 is why. 2020 has been difficult. It's been disorienting for so many. It, it doesn't mean that all of us have abandoned ship, right, and like turned our back on Jesus. But here's what I've found out, at least personally speaking. And this may just be a message for me this morning. I'm okay with that. I need to preach the gospel to myself just as much as you need to hear it. But I fear that what has suffered this past year in so many of our homes and so many of our hearts has been this steady progression, this growth and becoming more and more like Jesus, because of this pandemic, because of the ensuing isolation and the shutdowns and the increasing polarization in our culture, the tendency to drift away from Christian community and from spiritual disciplines and from laboring in prayer and from discipleship, engaging relationships, it's been overwhelming. We've talked with lots of pastors and we've seen surveys from different ministry organizations and Bible engagement is down and church attendance obviously is down and depression and anxiety is way up. Numerous, numerous calls from parents to us here. Yeah, TN takes them of parents concerned about their kids' anxiety and depression. Marriage after marriage, it's crumbling and coming apart at the seams because of all of the tension and stress of 2020. Per personally speaking... 2020 has been a bit of a wilderness experience for myself, struggling to find God in the midst of great disappointment and loss. And gosh, we launched this year as a church with some incredible initiatives for learning to live in community and on mission through off-campus groups, and all of that got wiped out. Uh, myself trying to figure out and wrestle with this tension in my own life for not being able to do the things that God has called me to do as a discipleship pastor. Not gathering as the body, not, not able to engage in disciple-making relationships like we used to. It's got me kind of scratching my head wondering, where's my significance and my value and my worth uh, as a pastor? And frankly, hundreds and hundreds of folks that call Grace Bible Church home, they, they're kind of unaccounted for. Because they just haven't shown back up on a weekend. And we haven't figured out how to uh, put the magical thing on the internet to get everybody to lean in anymore. Everyone has screen fatigue, right? And so here's the deal. 2020 has been rough. And as a result, some of our growth has suffered. Now, not for everybody, okay? Some of y'all are all about that hustle culture, okay? And you're coming out of 2020, haven't gotten a PhD, and run a six-minute mile, learned a new language. But you are the minority, folks. Not the majority. The majority of folks have struggled, have taken some steps back. In, in 2021, here's our prayer as pastors and elders, is that it would be different. Is that we would change our perspective heading into this new year with one task ahead of us and one big truth to buoy us and to equip us and to inspire us towards pressing on to knowing Jesus in greater ways this year and in making Jesus known in greater ways this year so that we might pursue Jesus wholeheartedly because God has something to say both to us in 2021 but also through us. And so one big task, one big truth from the Philippians chapter 3 this morning. You should be there. Uh, and, and quick disclaimer, um, the truth of the passage drives the task. The truth drives the task. It empowers, it equips, it motivates, it inspires. Uh, if you get that backwards, you're going you're gonna to be working from a deficit. So you ready? Let's do this. Philippians 3, starting in verse 12. You ready to grow up? Say grow up. Grow up already. Philippians 3, verse 12. Here we go. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. Any of those in here? Any not yet perfect ones? You haven't arrived? You haven't figured it all out? Okay, good. I'm not alone. All right, perfect. Not that I've already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on. Say press on. There's the big task. I press on to make it my own because, here's your one big truth. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. There's the ground of our pressing on. Don't ever forget that. We have been grasped and seized and taken hold of by Jesus if we are in 
Christ. And if that is true, that is the ground, the assurance, the motivating force, and the power of our pressing on. Verse 13. But, brothers... I've not done it yet. I have not arrived. I do not consider that I've made it my own. But one thing I do. Here's the task again. And in typical preacher fashion, he says, I've got one thing. And he gives us two things to do, right? His math. What is he doing? One thing I do, verse 13, forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead. There's that runner in that marathon reaching for the finish line. Verse 14, I press on. Towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. One big task, one big truth. Paul speaks of a goal here in 14. And he hasn't obtained this. He hasn't made it his own yet. It is a goal. It is a prize. It is a upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And what this call of God in Christ Jesus is wrapped up in the pursuit of perfection here. Ultimately, what Paul is talking about is he's joining every other New Testament author and affirming that the day is coming. That we will stand before our God perfect. Perfect. Perfectly saved. Perfectly justified. Perfectly sanctified. Perfectly glorified. No longer having to deal with these broken bodies that are so susceptible to sickness and to sin, to death and decay. If you went back one verse to verse 11, Paul talks about attaining to the resurrection from the dead. And what is he talking about? He's talking about that one cosmic event where Jesus is going to return and bring his forever kingdom with him. A new heavens and a new earth where he's going to dry every eye and make every sad thing come untrue. And it's going to be at that day where those of us who are in Christ will receive glorified bodies. The church of Jesus Christ is not perfect, but Jesus promises to perfect his church. And the day is coming and Paul says it's coming, but I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. It's coming. And I've been grasped by Jesus and he's made me his own. But I'm not there yet. And I'm pressing on and I'm leaning forward and I'm putting forth great effort to do so. And that's the call for us as well as we face a brand new year, 2021, with a whole bunch of baggage in the trunk from this last year. But to know exactly what Paul means When he talks about this big truth of being grasped by Jesus, we have to go back a little bit in the text because Paul wants to make it really clear that being made Jesus' own has everything to do with receiving a righteousness that comes from God, not a righteousness of his own making. So drop back to verse 8 with me because this is the goal. This is the goal. Pursuing Jesus, being fully known by Jesus, knowing Jesus intimately, having Jesus, and Jesus having all of us. Paul's going to tell us, man, that surpasses everything else that this world has to offer. And man, I hope by the time we're done, you would believe that, that the spirit of the living God would just give you a glimpse into the reality that whatever other thing you're trying to place your significance, hope, and value in, it falls way short compared to the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ. Look at verse 8. Paul says this, Philippians 3, verse 8. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Can we make that confession today? Have you ever made that confession today? Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, but a righteousness that comes from God, a righteousness on the basis of Faith. Now here's the deal. Paul says here, man, everything that I used to count as significant and valuable in my life, that has changed because I have been grasped by Jesus. He says, I want to gain Christ. I want to be found in him. And we know that he has. How do we know that he has? Because the big truth of verse 12, he has already been grasped by Jesus. Jesus has made Paul his own. 
And so we need to, we need to kind of, we need to grapple a little bit with what it means to gain Christ and to be found in Christ and to be held by Christ. It has everything to do with a gift of God of righteousness versus a do-it-yourself kind of righteousness. Look what he says there in verse 8. Everything I used to have as valuable, I no longer count it that way. See, Paul's heart cry here was that once Jesus Christ had revealed himself to him on the road to Damascus, that everything about how Paul evaluated worth and significance in his life had changed. It's almost as if he got a brand new scale in order to judge what was worthy and valuable in his life. And so now Paul says, everything else, I count them as loss. And it's important to know that like Paul had an impressive, uh, an impressive resume. A long list of these really great credentials that gave him passage in the religious world in which he lived. The man was one of the most brilliant and most feared Pharisees of the day. One of the greatest enemies of Christianity. He even says earlier in Philippians 3 that he was blameless according to the law. Perfect according to living out the commands of Scripture. He says, all those things are lost to me now. Why? Because Jesus, knowing Jesus, being known by Jesus, that flipped the scales for him on determining what was worthy and not. And let's be real. We count lots of things as valuable, don't we? I wonder, has 2020 challenged you to change and rethink how you determine what's of worth and what's of value? We count lots of things as valuable. Possessions, relationships, talents, accomplishments. Have you ever thought of what brings you value as an individual? What brings you significance and worth? Talking again about 2020, being a little transparent for myself. Man, when, when, when we had to radically change how we, do sh- uh, how we do church, we had to move online and figure out how to kind of pivot onto an online platform and we no longer gathered here and we weren't gathering in homes and small group ministry wasn't happening and uh, all the connections with disciple making relationships were kind of flitting away honestly I, 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 I scratched my head and wondered like what good am I everything that I determine my value and worth is connected to ministry and church activity and the love of God was knocking out those props from underneath me Because we serve a jealous God, a jealous God who loves us enough to expose a righteousness of our own making. I've said this before, if we place our hope and our faith in anything that death can take from us, we will be sorely disappointed. And so we need to learn to place our significance and our worth and our value in the one thing that nothing can take from us. An intimacy and a relationship with our God and Father through Jesus Christ. Our adoption as sons and daughters. And so God was beginning to show me, hey Cameron, like you're placing your significance and value in a whole bunch of stuff that this pandemic is exposing as way too important in your life. Let's go back to the brass tacks of you are a child of God and you are being loved by him. Is that enough for you, Cameron? Have you received a righteousness that comes from God? Not a righteousness of our own making because that's what was happening in Paul's life. All of the things that he had built his life upon that gave him incredible worth and value in the world in which he lived now did not hold as much weight for him because he had seen face to face the crucified risen Savior and realized, no, 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 what God says about me is more important than anything else the world has to offer. So Jesus had laid hold of Paul and in laying hold of Paul, he exposed to Paul all of the way that his righteousness of his own making fell short of God's. And as a result, Paul understood, no, 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 I want to know Jesus. I want to know him. I want to know him intimately. I didn't throw this up on the passage up on the screen, but in verse 10, Paul tells us what it means to know Jesus He says, I want to have a righteousness from God, verse 10, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. Who doesn't want to know the power of Jesus' resurrection? The power that liberates us and wakes us up from our spiritual death, that gives us victory over sin, Satan, and the grave. Paul says, I want to know Jesus and the power of his resurrection. And then he says, and I want to share, koinonia, I want to share in his suffering. 
Well, hold on, wait a second. I'm okay with the power of his resurrection. I don't know if I want to share in his sufferings. But Paul said, no, 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 no. Knowing Jesus isn't just experiencing power. It's also, it's also participating and partaking in the suffering that comes. And Jesus promised us that we'd have trouble in this world. Jesus told his disciples, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. There is a persecution that comes with carrying our cross and denying ourselves. And Paul goes on, I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to, I want to share in the fellowship his sufferings, being conformed to his death. Conformed, a print and a mold. Paul says, man, I want to die like Jesus did, obedient to the point of death. Humble and willing to sacrifice myself for the sake of other people. So that, verse 11, I might somehow attain to the resurrection of the dead. Paul is saying, man, I want to know Jesus so intimately. So the day that comes when Jesus makes me perfect, I stand before him perfect. Verse 12, not that I've already made it. Ah, now he introduces the tension of sanctification. We've talked about this word before. The tension of knowing this big truth that Paul has been grasped by Jesus. And if you are a Christian today, you have been seized and grasped by Jesus. Jesus has made you his own. Which means that now, because of the work of Christ for you and in you and through you, God looks at you and he does not see you on the basis of your performance. He sees you on the basis of Jesus' performance. He sees you as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's good news. That means that everything that God required for you to be able to come into his holy presence, he gave to you in grace to you in Jesus Christ. You couldn't be more holy than you are right now in Christ, even though you don't feel like it. Welcome to the tension of Christian sanctification. That word sanctification is a Greek word, hagias. It means holy or to be made holy. It means to be distinct and set apart and made different. God says, by virtue of your relationship with Jesus and his life, death, and resurrection and his ascension, you have been made holy. Listen, if you're a Christian, you are holy. You don't feel it though, do you? Be honest. Be honest. You want some more evidence of the tension of sanctification? Go read the New Testament authors. They're going to say things to you like, you are blameless. You are beyond reproach. Colossians 2, you are complete in Christ. You are forgiven, Ephesians 1. You are chosen and holy and beloved. These are true about you in Christ, even though you don't feel like it, act like it, or believe it some days. How do we press on? How do we press on to lay hold of that which Jesus has already laid hold of us when we feel like a fraud, when we struggle with temptation, when we, when we lose sight, our hearts are prone to wander? One big truth. One big truth. Paul says, I lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Are you in Christ this morning? If you are, then take great comfort in knowing that you have been wrapped up by the loving arms of your Savior. And there is nowhere you can go to get away from him. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And his indwelling, inexhaustible, able life will fuel your pursuit of pressing on. One big truth. You have been made Jesus' own. One big task. Let's press on. Let's press on. So what does it mean to press on? How do we press on? Well, verse 14, he tells us, verse 13. Brothers, sisters, I do not consider that I have made it my own. This perfection has not been co completely perfected in me yet. I have not made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the, up, for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. One thing I do, here's the one big task. There is an incredible single-mindedness to Paul here. I, I've, 
I don't think I've ever been single-minded in my life. I'm like uh, the dog on Disney's Up, squirrel. It's difficult to stay focused. And, and yet, and yet, this idea of one thing is instrumental to the Christian life. Paul says, one thing I do, I press on. I press on. And it's going to be difficult in 2021 to be so focused on this one thing because many of us, many of us, if we're go-getters, we're going to feel like, man, we got to make up for lost time, lost profits, lost creativity, lost production, lost fill in the blank. Brothers, I do not consider to have made it my own. How do we press on not forgetting that Jesus has made us his own? We need to do some biblical forgetting and we need to do some reaching forward. And here's what I want you to know. Here's one of the big ideas of this text. The heart of a true Christian who is growing up in Christ is evidenced by their single-minded pursuit of Jesus wholeheartedly. The heart of a true Christian is evidenced, it is seen, it is on display by a single-minded pursuit of Jesus. Is that you? And even if it's not, it doesn't mean that you're not in Christ. It means that our hearts are prone to wander and we need to be called back to a single-minded devotion and a dissatisfaction with anything else the world can offer us. So how do we do it? We forget and we reach forward. What does it mean to forget? Forgetting what is behind us, he says there in verse 14. Forgetting what is behind us. Let's, let's talk a little bit about biblical forgetting. Biblical forgetting. I made that up. I don't even know what that means, but I'm going to try to explain it. Biblical forgetting. You know, Paul didn't get some spiritual gift of amnesia from God, right? Where he just kind of forgets everything in his past. If you're not familiar with Paul's past, go read Acts 7, 8, and 9. He was a persecutor of the church. A murderer. Used by, God, or used by the Pharisees and the, the religious elite of Judaism to try to stamp out the movement of Christ. Before Jesus grabbed Paul, Paul was the Osama bin Laden of his day. Stamping out infidels, he thought, to the glory of his God. He had a lot of junk in his trunk. But biblical forgetting is not where God presses the delete button and everything up in our brain banks go away. No, biblical forgetting is let, no longer letting what lies behind us to name us any longer. Biblical forgetting is no longer letting our identity be tied and determined by our past. Our past doesn't name us any longer. God names us if we are in Christ and he calls us his being loved Children, this doesn't mean that we still don't have the consequences of our former choices, but you are not your rap sheet. You are not your failures. Our identity is not rooted in our performance. It's rooted in the name we receive from our Heavenly Father. That's why Christian maturity, we say this a lot around here, Christian maturity is not about behaving better. It's about believing better. Believing that we are who God says we are. And so part of pressing on towards 2021 is forgetting our past. Not letting, us, not letting it name us any longer. But we don't just need to forget our past, uh, past failures. You know what else we need to forget? We need to forget some of our past successes. We need to forget some of our past successes. Here's why. If we're not careful... Some of the things we accomplished in our past will invariably lead us to believe that we can do it without God again. Our hustle culture says you just got to grind a little bit harder. You got to push a little bit more. You got to be a little bit more ingenuous. And then you can make the thing work, whatever it is. And Paul says, no, 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 no. I had everything that I needed to to, to rise to a place of great stature in the religious world in which I live. But that was rubbish to me now. And I can't let that blind me to what God wants to do moving forward. So biblically forgetting. We forget that our past no longer names us. Our past successes can't set us up for future failures because we're failing to trust in God. And he, here's one also that I wasn't sure if I wanted to share. But we, we need to forget some of the past revelations that we got from God. 
revelation, illumination. Uh, what I mean is this. Some of y'all are still camping out on that same rock 20 years ago when God revealed himself. And you've not heard from God since. We serve a living God who is still revealing himself right here, right now. Chiefly through his word, through his people. You want to hear a joke? How does God reveal himself to his children? Any way he wants. For those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. And we need to forget some of the ways in which God revealed himself so that we can be looking for God doing a new thing. That doesn't mean we ignore. There's a passage in 1 Samuel at uh, Ebenezer. There was a victory and they built a pile of rocks to commemorate and build an altar to the victory of God. And they called it Ebenezer. The pile of rocks where God delivered. That's why we sing in Christ alone. Here I raise my Ebenezer. My pile of rocks. The spiritual marker where God did that thing. But we need to forget sometimes. So that we're not only ever looking for God to do that thing in that same way. So we're pressing on. 2021. We're pressing on by forgetting our past doesn't name us any longer. Our successes aren't the only way that God's going to accomplish. Our revelations, they can look different because we serve a God who is still speaking. And in the very same breath, not only are we forgetting what's behind, we are straining forward to what's ahead. This is that runner in that marathon reaching for the end. Picture me running that race and don't picture me running that race. It was very underwhelming. Picture somebody else running that race and reaching for the goal with all of their strength and all of their stamina. Picture her or him throwing their body forward. I don't even know what body part goes first. Is it the hand? Is it the foot? I don't know. Is it the head? But picture extraneous. I don't even know the word because I'm not very athletic. But picture it. That's what they're called to do. As a runner running a race, straining forward with hands wide open, saying, okay, God, I don't, I don't know what's next. I don't know what 2021 is going to hold, but I know you. And I know that you are still alive, still revealing yourself. And the reason that we do this, the reason that we press on, the reason that we press on by forgetting what's behind and straining what's, what's ahead of us is because, verse 14, the upward call of God in Christ The goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ. Here's the prize. You want want to know what the prize is? The prize for 2021 and pressing on for each of us who belong to Jesus is the, is the, the revelation of the nature of God. An intimate and experiential knowledge of who God is. And what God has done and is doing and promises to do in you as you, through you. I think we'd all agree that there is an ocean of difference between knowing about something and knowing that thing intimately and personally and experientially. That's what Paul was after. He was after such an intimate knowing of Jesus that everything that Jesus experienced, he could experience. Everything that Jesus felt, he could feel it. So that he could rightly embody Jesus to the people God had called him to serve. And so the prize, the revelation of who God is in every single moment, how God feels about Paul in every single moment. See, the prize is not feeling good. The prize is not impressing other people with what God has taught us. The prize is not getting status in our community of faith. The prize is not being a pastor who gets his significance and worth from lots of small groups. Like the prize is rooted in God revealing himself to me and then through me to other people. And if we are growing up to look more and more like Jesus, then the goal has always been a clearer and clearer expression of the life of Christ. You do know that the good news of the gospel wasn't just so that you could get your sins forgiven and one day go to heaven. Like that's a deficient gospel. It's good news. And we rejoice in the past and future tense implications of the gospel. But there is a present tense power to the gospel that says that we have now been joined to the very life of Jesus By way of the Spirit of God, not for the improvement of our character, but for the expression of Jesus' 
character. So that we might become the one of a kind, unique expression of Jesus to everyone we come across. There will only ever be one you, one Christ in you. Colossians 1.27. Paul writes about the mystery of the gospel. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Can you imagine what 2021 could look like if all of us were committed to pressing on, to becoming as accurate an expression of the life of Jesus Christ we could become? Oh, man. How the heartland would see the love of God through the unique expression of Jesus Christ. And it can happen as we ground ourselves in the one big truth that Jesus has made us his own. And we give ourselves to the one big task of pressing on and forgetting what's behind and reaching forward. That's what Paul says. Paul says, I haven't arrived yet. And there's going to be days where I blow it. There's going to be days where I believe a lie and forget who I am in Christ. There's going to be days where my behavior is inconsistent with my identity in Christ. And I'm going to need brothers and sisters to remind me who I am in Christ and what's true about me. Because my identity is not rooted in my performance, but in who God says I am. I'm going to blow it sometimes, but my performance does not name me. My God does. And so I'm pressing on and I'm learning to become what I already am. You want a definition of sanctification? It is growing up into who we already are in Christ. His holy, righteous, being loved children. Moment by moment. Day by day, pandemic by pandemic, every single situation, God's gift for us to trust him. And so church family, the invitation this year as we approach 2021 is to grow up. And we can because we belong to Jesus. And I can't wait one week, y'all. And we're going to launch 2021 Abide, 21 days of prayer and fasting, inviting our entire community into setting aside so that we can seek God's face and ask him for revival here in our own hearts and in the Heartland region and to see a move of God, not just in our neighborhoods and our cities, but back out in the prison at APCI and to all of the nooks and crannies of the Heartland region so that we can see the good news of the gospel saturate every inch of the Heartland region. And it starts with us being committed to pressing on. Would you commit to growing up this year with us? Let's do it. Father, we trust you. And we thank you for your goodness to us and through us. We need you. And we have you. Oh, you have grasped us with your love. We have been seized by the strong, sovereign hand of Jesus. And you will never let us go even when we feel like we are lost at sea. Jesus, would you remind us of your great love to us? And Father, for those in this room that have never called on the name of Jesus who truly are lost at sea, God, would you reveal to them that the good news of the gospel is that Jesus came to live the life none of us could live and to die the death each of us deserved and was risen from the dead victorious over every enemy that ever stood against us so that we might receive life and life eternally in Christ Thank you, Jesus, that you love us enough to be born in a manger, to grow up a a life of poverty, to experience incredible betrayal and agonizing death, to fulfill the Father's will, to die in the place of sinful men and women because you loved us. Thank you, God. Thank you for loving us. May we press on. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said. Amen.